Computers. We use them every single day, throughout almost every moment of our day. Whether we're sitting in front of them at work, staring at boring spreadsheets, or browsing Reddit on the little computer that we call a smartphone, they permeate our entire lives. When most people think of the origin of computers, they imagine a giant room-sized machine like the IBM Harvard Mark I from the 1940s. And they're right, the computers are old, older even than they may imagine. Defining computers can be tricky. At one point, it was a job description. Now, it describes a device that helps people do everything from traditional number computation to liking cat pics on social media. So it may be best to go back to the origin of why we wanted help computing numbers before we get to how we ended up with websites like Twitter and Reddit. I'm Daniel Seehausen, and this is The Answer Archive. So let's start from the beginning, the very beginning. Prior to written history, people were already documenting numbers in clever ways. Through carving little notches into bones and sticks, numbers could be stored to be retrieved later. The Ashango bone is one of the oldest known tools of this sort, dating to as far back as 20,000 BC. These devices were known as tally sticks, and they lasted for a long time. The British government only decided that the system of storing tally sticks to reflect contracts was out of date in 1826, after having been used since the Middle Ages. The sticks were split in half, and the bank recording the ownership kept one side, called the foil, and the individual who owned a share in the company kept the other side, called the stock. And that is where we get the term stock market. Unfortunately, during the dismantling of this tally stick system, when the sticks were being burned, the inferno got out of control, and they took the House of Commons and the House of Lords with them. Around the same time that tally sticks were falling out of favor, the amount of information in the world was increasing. For example, in 1766, the British Royal Observatory commissioned computers of the human sort around the country to produce a nautical almanac that would help sailors navigate safely. Most of these computers were former clerks or clergy that worked from home on creating tables of data that would eventually end up in the almanac. While work of this sort was becoming more frequent in Britain, across the channel, France was stirring up some political and data processing revolutions. After the French Revolution, the brand new government decided to shake up both the system of property taxation and the entire system of weights and measures simultaneously. They charged a man named Gaspard de Prony with creating an accurate land survey of France and with unifying all the measurements into the new metric system. This project would soon become the largest data processing and collection endeavor the world had yet known. Luckily, de Prony had an idea that would make the project more manageable. While considering Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, which describes manufacturing pens more effectively through the division of labor, de Prony conceived all of a sudden the idea of applying the same method to the immense work with which he had been burdened, and to manufacture logarithms as one manufactures pens. Gaspard de Prony went on to organize a computational factory in tiers, with mathematicians at the top working the theory, all the way down to around 70 human computers doing basic difference operations. These computers were mostly former hairdressers, who lost their jobs when fancy French hairstyles died in popular fashion, because some very fancy French people died in a popular fashion. This method produced tables far more quickly than the freelance style of the nautical almanac. But unfortunately, it didn't become widespread in his era, in part because the tables were never published due to economic instability in the French Republic. However, Gaspard de Prony's legacy lives on, and his name is one of the 72 enshrined on the Eiffel Tower for his contributions to science and engineering. Gaspard de Prony's work would go on to influence the history of computing more dramatically, though, when a young mathematician and economist named Charles Babbage visited France in the 1810s. There, he learned of de Prony's work. Babbage had some experience producing tables similar to de Prony. He worked on star tables for the Astronomical Society with his friend John Herschel, son of the famous astronomer William Herschel, who discovered Uranus. These star tables were calculated by freelancers, just like the Nautical Almanac. Babbage and Herschel oversaw the project and checked the tables for errors. Around this time, Babbage started conceiving of a mechanical solution to the tedium of all this computational work, saying, I wish to God these calculations had been executed by steam. In an open letter to the president of the Royal Society, Babbage described de Prony's work in detail and outlined how a device he was working on could speed up the process of table making and improve accuracy. This proposed device was called the Difference Engine, and it would go on to dominate the next decade of Babbage's life. 
Babbage worked tirelessly on version after version of his difference engine, partially with funding from the British government and partially with his own money. When finished, the engine was supposed to automate the work of the lowest level computers and do it even faster than they could. It also would have printed these tables and eliminated some of the large number of errors that were introduced during the printing process. In 1832, Babbage finally managed to complete a small, functioning portion of his engine, which proved without a doubt that the concept was achievable. Babbage kept this part in his home as a novelty to spark conversation among his guests. Despite his hopes, one of the only visitors who showed continued interest was a young woman named Ada Byron, daughter of the eccentric poet Lord Byron. She became a dear friend to Babbage, and he mentored her in mathematics, science, and engineering. Unfortunately, at this point, a tide of issues swept over the project, from Babbage losing his main engineer, wild mismanagement of costs, to a changing of the guard in upper levels of government. These issues ultimately drowned the project, with the final nails in the coffin being Babbage discussing a substantial redesign of the engine, and simultaneously promoting a new project that he was thinking up that could do far more than the difference engine. He called it the analytical engine. Babbage raising the prospect of another engine while failing to complete the first caused the government to lose faith in him. After this, he didn't receive any more government funding for his projects. In 1991, the London Science Museum finally took Babbage's plans for the redesigned difference engine and brought them into existence. The engine worked with only a few small changes. Charles Babbage would eventually go down in history as the father of computing. But it wasn't because of the difference engine, which he got very close to completing. It was for the analytical engine, which he only managed to construct a small part of before his death in 1871. The analytical engine that Babbage conceived of was a mammoth undertaking and was a precursor to the digital computers we have today. For the next decade, Babbage focused on the design of his new engine. But his concentration was frequently disturbed by loud music outside his London home. In frustration, he lobbied to make street music illegal. One quote from the 25 full pages of his autobiography dedicated to the subject puts it well. I have obtained in my own country an unenviable celebrity, not by anything I have done, but simply by a determined resistance to the tyranny of the lowest mob, whose love, not of music, but of the most discordant noises, is so great that it insists upon enjoying it at all hours and in every street. This fame may have backfired on him, as street musicians began harassing him. Regardless, he did make great progress on designing his analytical engine, which shared many of the principles of modern computers. If it had been built, it would have had a control barrel analogous to today's CPUs, a mill similar to an arithmetic logic unit, and a store that would hold data and memory, similar to RAM. It was even programmable, with punched cards that had been invented to weave patterns and tapestries in a machine called the Jacquard Loom. After years of work, Babbage was invited to give a presentation on the analytical engine in Italy. This visit culminated in an audience with the Sardinian king himself. This was such a high point in Babbage's life that he dedicated his autobiography to the king's son, saying, To the king, your father, I am indebted for the first public and official acknowledgement of this invention. I am happy in thus expressing my deep sense of that obligation to his son, the sovereign of United Italy, the country of Archimedes and of Galileo. During this visit to Italy, Babbage asked an Italian mathematician to write an account of his analytical engine. A few years later, the mathematician published it in French. Back in England, Ada Byron, who had since married and become Countess Lovelace, decided to translate this article into English. Babbage persuaded her to add some notes of her own. She did so, and in fact, more than tripled the length of the original account. Her poetic writing helped people understand the power and beauty of the analytical engine in a way that Babbage had difficulty expressing. One memorable passage says, We may say most aptly that the analytical engine weaves algebraical patterns just as the Jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. Babbage so deeply appreciated Ada Lovelace's work that he called her his dear and much admired interpreter. For her contributions to the beginnings of computer science, Ada Lovelace was honored by having the programming language Ada named after her. After his failure to receive any funding for the analytical engine in the 1840s, Babbage took a 10-year break from working on it, and he pursued other projects. 
But in 1856, he returned to working on his engine and became a bit of a recluse, and he filled notebooks with thoughts on his designs. When Babbage lay on his deathbed in 1871, having never built more than a small portion of his engine, the street musicians came back for a little revenge and had children whack tin pails outside his bedroom window as he lay dying. 35 years after Charles Babbage died, his son paid the R.W. Monroe Company to manufacture the mill portion of his father's designs. It successfully printed the first 25 multiples of pi. Charles Babbage was the first in a long line of computing pioneers that would put smartphones in our pockets and PCs on all our desks. He laid the groundwork on the design that computers use even today. Though he was far ahead of his time and died not realizing his vision, Babbage was crucial for getting the ball rolling on digital computers. And over a hundred years later, he would inspire future engineers to develop better versions of his analytical engine that would help put men on the moon and cat pictures in our faces. One such engineer, studying for a PhD at Harvard in 1936, Howard Aiken, began to conceive of a digital calculator. When he pitched it to the faculty there, it was met with limited enthusiasm, if not downright antagonism. One of the techs approached Aiken and said, he couldn't see why in the world I wanted to do anything like this, because we already had such a machine and nobody ever used it. When pressed, the tech took him to the attic and showed him a set of calculating wheels on wooden frames the remains of Charles Babbage's engines, donated to Harvard by his son. Aiken was enthralled, and he began furiously studying Babbage's life and work. While reading Babbage's autobiography, Aiken came across this passage. If, unwarned by my example, any man shall undertake and shall succeed in really constructing an engine, upon different principles or by simpler mechanical means, I have no fear of leaving my reputation in his charge for he alone will be fully able to appreciate the nature of my efforts and the value of their results. He said he felt that Babbage was addressing him personally from the past. Aiken decided to make a proposal to IBM.